Hello and welcome to another episode of my podcast called On The Payroll, where I talk about anything and everything from leadership, consulting, project delivery, Salesforce, creating great teams, how to deliver great projects, and topics like this that actually I can get my teeth into, especially when I speak to people who share the same kind of interest in these topics like I do, it makes for a very interesting conversation. Today, I have Barton Ledford. He is the practice lead with B3, and we dive deep into the concept of center of excellence and how he has built that for one of the largest implementation in America. I really, really hope that you will get as much out of this as I did. Enjoy. Hello, Barton. Welcome to On The Payroll, my podcast about consulting, about CRM, Salesforce, leadership, anything and everything that interests me. How are you today? I'm great, Pay. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yes, indeed. Yeah, catch up. There, there, there's an element of that. Um, we connected with, with each other at a previous company, um, but even though we were on some calls together, I've not had the opportunity to get to know you. Uh, so this is my opportunity. So why don't uh, we start by you just taking us on the journey of your career and how you got to the point where you are now, which is hitting the Salesforce practice at B3. Sure, it's been a long and exciting journey, it feels like, uh, even though I'm just now 40 years old. Uh, I started uh, actually as an intern for a textile manufacturing company that also is into chemicals in uh, South Carolina, where I grew up uh, as a Lotus Notes developer uh, intern. I did that for a couple of years and they they hired me on uh, full time afterward. And I did uh, actually COBOL on the VAX uh, for uh, about another year. And then the Lotus Notes team wanted me back. So I moved back over there and uh, I got some uh, interesting experience looking at the uh, textile manufacturing process and um, got uh, a bit more into the more advanced technologies. This company was you know, well over 100 years old, but starting to get into the uh, .NET uh, arena. Uh, so we started getting into Microsoft uh, VB.NET and uh, did some biz talk and e-commerce server, uh, a lot of those new, newer uh, .NET Microsoft products that were coming out in the early 2000s. <clears throat> and then a friend of mine uh, that was working with me uh, got called back to a consulting firm uh, that was uh, some people that he had originally gotten an offer from by Anderson right before they uh, collapsed. And uh, so he was, they were back on their feet again and I uh, went to work for a consulting firm that's uh, big in the public sector and uh, also the commercial space a little bit, but I was, I was actually more on the commercial space side doing PeopleSoft consulting. So I did uh, PeopleSoft implementations, upgrades um, for about six years after that. Uh, so that uh, allowed me to get really good uh, experience with a lot of Fortune 100 companies, um, ERP, uh, we were doing, I was doing ma mainly human resources, uh, but also financial services, uh, EPM implementations and upgrades. I actually worked on the uh, Wachovia uh, Wells Fargo merger in 2008. So I was one of the people that was lucky to have a job soon in 2008 when uh, the financial collapse was happening. It actually gave me more work because uh, these mergers of all the banks were happening. Um, and uh, I eventually ended up leaving that company uh, 2011 because mainly I got tired of traveling. I was traveling four days a week, uh, you know, 500 trips a year. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, so I got really burned out on that. I was ready to start a family. Uh, and I uh, had heard of this technology called Salesforce. 
and my a friend of mine uh, had been doing it a little bit on the side uh, for one of the companies that he was consulting for. And uh, I saw that as an opportunity to not have to be behind a firewall anymore, not have to travel uh, since it was all cloud-based, this new technology. Um, so we uh, decided to start our own consulting firm uh, in 2011. So it was a big leap. I had uh, made some pretty good progress in the PeopleSoft ecosystem. I was a tech lead, you know, the head tech guy on a multi-million dollar project. Um, I was manager, about to be director level. So uh, it was a big leap for me to leave all of that knowledge that I had gained in PeopleSoft behind to make the leap to Salesforce. But turns out it was one of the best decisions that I made in my career. So I'm uh, extremely uh, grateful that I made that leap uh, back then. So we started out uh, just working for one of the companies that he had actually worked with before, before. And uh, we floundered a bit and uh, never really got good traction as our own firm. So he and I actually both went to work for another uh, Salesforce system integrator mm -hmm. that was uh, growing at the time. Uh, I think we were a little bit uh, around 75 people uh, based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, we that was my really in-depth experience with Salesforce. I actually, they had a, an incentive when I started that I could um, get a pay bump if I got certifications. So uh, I actually got my first certification before I even started, before I even, and I had done, not done much Salesforce at all with the consulting company. This was like barely new Salesforce. I got my 401 cert. Uh, so that proves that it can be done. Just a question. So you move from PeopleSoft to Salesforce and you mm -hmm. started a company. So I'm just uh, having a quick look at your profile. You said, I gave up the life of full-time traveling PeopleSoft consultant to start a business in the rapidly growing space of Salesforce technology. So you jumped across it's 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 a brand new platform right how did you oh look that looks quite good over there <clears throat> how yeah you know, just talk me through the process that you went through yeah so uh i mean there was there were a lot of factors uh one i was just completely done with traveling and had had a lot of uh trouble uh, building a long-term relationship with uh you know you meet somebody and say all right i'll see you next weekend <laughs> or maybe I'm traveling that weekend, I'll see you in two weeks. It just, it's just really hard to do. So I was you know, somewhat desperate. The project that I was on at the time also happened to be really sour. Um, I was, uh, you know, my, the tech lead for this merger actually between uh, a conglomerate and one of the companies that they um, owned. So messy politics. Um, not everybody is fully bought into the idea. Uh, it's hard to talk to people. Uh, people don't want to be a part of it because they think they're going to lose their job as a result. Um, the, the nature of the technology was uh, a little bit antiquated. Um, people soft had been bought by Oracle yeah. <laughs> not too long before that. My question actually is did you think that in the Salesforce world that there would not be any of this because it is a product as well? In theory, if you yeah. carried down a consulting line and got really good at it, that would be your kind of lifestyle. So I'm trying to um, understand how you are so established in PeopleSoft world to look at a new platform and go, I'm going to take my chances on you. You know, my yeah, product hasn't been great, but. Part of that being, you know, somewhat antiquated. I see how much trouble it is to upgrade every year. People are spending a million dollars to upgrade and they're living on technology that's four or five years old, whereas Salesforce gives you these automatic upgrades three times a year. And yeah, there's just, I had to still deal with servers and installing things on a CD <laughs> and trying to make sure you have enough server space to be able to scale and things that I didn't really want to think about. I'm a developer mm -hmm. at heart. I wanted to think about really building cool applications and cool products. And so I saw Salesforce as this, you know, way to focus on just that. 
and not have to worry about servers and hardware and uh, having to fool with technology that's three or four years old. That was that was a big part of it. Um, but then, you know, Salesforce marketing was starting to pick up. I think that year at the Super Bowl was when Chatter had a Super Bowl commercial. Uh, so it was, uh, I saw it as, as a really good opportunity. Um, and so I think I was at, uh, we, we had gone to work for a consulting firm. Uh, that was really good experience, a uh, really good opportunity too. They uh, actually had some decent sized clients uh, and some cool clients got to work for NASCAR. I think it was one of our first projects. Um, uh, worked on uh, the TV network that does all the ACC football games. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the big real estate companies in Charlotte, Duke Energy, one of the big uh, power companies. So it was actually some decent, uh, decent projects and decent experience for a small company like that. Um, but then, uh, you know, as a result of all that uh, good experience and good growth, they were an acquisition target. So they were acquired uh, by an Indian conglomerate company. Um, and uh, I got really nervous about that because uh, they, they said there weren't going to be any changes, but all of our leadership left. We got new leadership uh, that was mostly offshore. Um, my first project after the acquisition was with Duke Energy and uh, in Nevada, <laughs> whereas all my other projects have been in Charlotte. So I was like, nope, time out. I did not want to travel. Uh, did not want that. It, it's not, not the reason I got into Salesforce. So let me see what else is out there. And around that time, I got a, a intro to code science um, where I was uh, brought in in 2014 as the uh, first true technical architect. Um, before that, it was kind of uh, ownership led. Uh, they were most of the architects were salespeople that uh, just happened to be really good architects also and tried to stand up the project as best they could. Um, but I was that first uh, deline- delineation from sales to delivery for code science as they were about 22 people, I think, when I started. Um, so, uh, I got to be part of a really cool thing there and experienced a lot of growth uh, year over year. I think we were growing about 35% uh, for the six years I was there, um, up to um, 150 plus, maybe 180. I don't remember exactly the number. Um, but there we were building uh, products for ISVs and uh, products for the App Exchange, which was really cool. Uh, I got to live that product world and I fell in love with it uh, of being able to come up with cool idea and bring it into the market and see what market reaction was to it and iterate on it. Um, Really given getting into the true agile sense. Um, We also got to work with a lot of really cool companies from two person startups to also major fortune 500 companies um, that were building their own uh, apps and getting into getting, trying to take advantage of that Salesforce market too, because the app exchange had grown you know, significantly over that period of time and everybody needed a Salesforce app so they could get a piece of that market share. And everybody was like, you don't integrate with Salesforce. I don't want to use your products. And they were like, okay, here we integrate with Salesforce now. Um, so I got, I, I got the opportunity to work on 50 plus projects or products, I actually, during that time period, um, from a hands-on and then from a leadership standpoint, uh, probably close to 200 different products um, between OEM and ISV. We also were brought into Salesforce a fair amount, which was really cool to build some things for them. Uh, we built the first version of Health Cloud uh, as a, kind of a prototype for them to be able to sell internally. Um, it's not the version that's there today, so don't blame any of those problems on me, but <laughs> uh, it was a really cool uh, experience to be able to do that. We also built a trailhead for distribution. Uh, it's kind of the internal training module for the Salesforce sales team. Um, and right before we left, we built the uh, COVID functionality into Health Cloud um, that needed to be stood up within three or four months. Mm-hmm. It was pretty crazy. 
Um, but Salesforce called on us a lot for some of those uh, hot, and net, hot and ready projects that we needed to deliver on quickly. Um, we also actually built some DX functionality uh, around custom metadata types uh, and making sure that those were fully uh, tested uh, as part of the DX rollout. Uh, I think our, our CEO had a really good uh, really good relationship with Wade Wagner, who was the SVP of uh, platform for Salesforce at the time. So got to meet with him and got to meet with uh, Andy Fawcett, uh, who was the CTO at um, Financial Force and uh, Wade had brought him on. So I got to hear some of their cool ideas. I was actually in one of the early conversations that was had about uh, evergreen functions, Salesforce Lightning functions at a Dreamforce in 2019-ish, maybe the Dreamforce before it was announced when it was still a conceptual idea and they wanted to get feedback from people like me that were building ISV products and how it might impact the ecosystem um, that is the Salesforce ISVs, which is quite different from uh, the Salesforce uh, uh, commercial uh, side of things. Um, so that was a really cool experience. Um, and then COVID happened and uh, things were looking a little bit uh, scary. Uh, we didn't really know what was going to happen with the market. Uh, I was working for a consulting firm and consulting is typically a business. This is really easy to turn off. Uh, it's not like a product where you're, um, you, you have to spend a million dollars to migrate off of a product. Whereas a consulting firm, you can say, all right, we're done with this project. We'll see you later. That actually happened to me in 08 when I was working for uh, Constellation Energy in Baltimore. They got bought by um, Warren Buffett and uh, he told us all to leave the next day. <laughs> wow. uh, that, I didn't want that to happen again. Um, and I had always kind of wanted to be on the other side of the fence. Uh, from being a consultant and being living in the product world and actually seeing what it's like to uh, deliver the product and uh, get that real customer feedback and uh, be able to iterate and do you know, have a lot of controlling decisions as opposed to somebody else making the real decisions and me just acting on them as a consultant. Um, so I went to Fontiva and uh, joined them as CTO. Uh, the recent uh, CTO had left not too long before that. So uh, the need was there and the opportunity presented itself. So uh, I took that leap. Um, and uh, it was a whole new ballgame. It was uh, a lot more than I had anticipated uh, of having to build the product, deliver the product, support the product all those different things were coming from all different directions and um it was uh, definitely a lot more to it than i had expected and then we were also trying to build a marketplace um our own fontiva app exchange at the same time so a lot of different initiatives that we were starting to get off the ground uh getting an etl tool um that we could standardize on and then another acquisition happened and uh, that was actually my fourth acquisition. I didn't mention, actually, no, that was my third. Uh, I didn't mention one that happened when I was at uh, Bearing Point. We got acquired by PwC, which was a good thing because Bearing Point went into bankruptcy. And uh, the commercial side went to PwC. The public sector side went to Deloitte. Um, so we got acquired by Together Work, a uh, private equity firm uh, that owned Together Work. And uh, that was another uh, struggle of a, an acquisition personally. Um, we went through some, uh, some uh, budget cuts and uh, trying to streamline the business and synergize with the other businesses that together work had bought, uh, converging of leadership, um, consolidating of functions uh, around HR finance, typical things that uh, a company that's buying a bunch of other companies would be doing. Um, so I was struggling a little bit to find my place and uh, probably nine months before that happened, the guy that lives across the street from me uh, had started asking me to come work for him. Um, from the time we were both building houses at the same time across the street and every, almost every time he would see me, he'd say, I think you'd be great uh, working with us. Uh, let's talk about it someday. And uh, 
then he took me to TPC Sawgrass here in Ponte Vedra, which is uh, really nice for lunch and really uh, laid it down thick after the acquisition happened. And I said, all right, I think I'll give it a shot. I didn't know B3 even existed before that. I was like, who is this guy? Don't know him, don't know B3, never heard of him in the Salesforce ecosystem before. And uh, once I learned more and more about it, and uh, actually another big deciding factor in making that leap was Jim Hutcherson uh, had recently joined as VP of Cloud Platforms. And he wrote this book on uh, Salesforce architecture. And I loved working for a technical manager before um, at Code Science, having uh, Spoon and Brian there as being super technical CEOs uh, was something that I really enjoyed. And it's always great to people understand everything that I'm doing. So the opportunity to have another person like Jim that I could uh, report to that, um, you know, could be that voice for me in uh, the C level uh, and also, you know, fully understands everything from a technical standpoint all the way to trying to manage people uh, was kind of the nail in the coffin that made me take that leap again. Um, so uh, actually found out another thing is that uh, B3 manages the largest public sector implementation of Salesforce and the fifth largest overall implementation of Salesforce globally uh, at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, so that was uh, another really cool thing. Once I found that out and with Jim and that knowledge, I was like, this is a really cool opportunity. So uh, now I'm actually the uh, director of the Center of Excellence for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, probably one of the largest Salesforce programs that exists. Um, if not the largest, uh, being public sector means that there's a lot more people that are needed to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed and uh, things are a little bit slower. Um, but as a result, uh, there's a lot more need for a center of excellence that can take all of these disparate uh, system integrators that are building their own modules and their own orgs and try to make sure we're doing things as efficient as possible. We are um, have a consistent release process. We have a consistent DevOps process. We have a consistent help desk that uh, everybody is routed through. Um, we have consistent architecture that everybody's going to play nice together in the same orgs, that it's going to scale well, that we're being good stewards of our standard objects, account, contact, case. Um, there's obviously limits and that we're not taking up too much of the, the limits and leaving limits for other apps and other system integrators that need to be in the orgs. So that's kind of the role that we play as B3. Um, we've got uh, major system integrators in there, Accenture Federal, Booz Allen, um, Liberty IT, which is now part of Booz Allen, Acumen, Salesforce has got a really uh, large presence, um, both Acumen and non-Acumen. Um, I feel like I'm leaving somebody else out, but uh, there's a few other uh, system integrators in there as well. Um, it's really cool to have dedicated platform architects. It's my first opportunity to have that. So we've got um, really four, uh, depending on how you count them, full-time Salesforce PAs, which is uh, helpful to have. Um, and then I've got another um, eight uh, Salesforce architects that are part of the center of excellence. So we don't do any development. We're just there as stewards, as guidance, as best practices, um, building common frameworks, building the DevOps, uh, designing release management, all those kind of fun things. So uh, that was a long history of how I got to where I am now. Um, I've got, no, it's really, really interesting. So I've got um, two questions that came out of your last bit. So. Um, so help me understand a little bit. So B3 is a Salesforce partner, mm -hmm. but you run the COE for this program, which is helping, can you just, uh, I didn't catch it. Did you say it was the vet force? Uh, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. Department so. of Veteran Affairs. So you are helping them manage 
the whole program. Can you just talk to me a little bit about how the whole structure came to be and what are the key things that anyone who's thinking about setting up a center of excellence has to think about? So can I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, but before you came along, they didn't have one. They were just managing disparate orgs, disparate partners. And then they said, hang on, we need to pull this together mm -hmm. and poof. Or maybe not poof. Yeah, <laughs> still still pooping. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think they started using Salesforce in 2017. And uh, at the time, there it was kind of a free-for-all. They did have uh, a good sense about how they wanted it to be, though. They weren't, it wasn't just a total free-for-all. They, they knew that they wanted something like a center of excellence at the time. So they were pushing people in that direction. Um, B3 actually got their contract in 2018. Uh, so we're about halfway through our uh, five-year contract right now, I believe, um, where we stood up the preferred center of excellence. But at the time, it was just one org. Um, and I don't know how many system integrators were involved at the beginning. Uh, and since 2018, uh, the program has essentially doubled in size every year. Uh, to where now we have uh, well over 200 apps. Uh, the VA also happens to be the fourth largest healthcare system in the U.S. Um, they also manage loans and benefits administration for all the veterans uh, of the armed forces. They also have, uh, I think, over 200,000 employees. Um, so, and then they're, they've so they've got some employee modules there as well. They've got all, they track all their vaccines in Salesforce. Um, so now we're in six orgs. Uh, we'll be moving to eight this year. Uh, and we've got two implementations of Health Cloud. We've got um, everything is uh, FedRAMP uh, high required. So GovCloud Plus, we're in the process of migrating our last two orgs over to GovCloud Plus this month. Um, we are, uh, also have, you know, very high PII, PHI requirements. So all those things that we have to take into account, uh, we've got integrations with the department of defense now, um, so that veterans can, uh, have all of their medical history when they, uh, leave the, the force, um, there from the medical providers, they'll, they'll have all their history from when they were in service which is really cool and I think will be really helpful to the care coordination that will happen for veterans going forward. Something I'm really excited about that's actually going live next month. Um, and yeah, I think that did, did that answer your question? Yeah. No, that did not. That was interesting, but it didn't. But my question was, um, do you have, let's say, uh, if I, what are top five things that someone has to think about if they are just thinking about starting a center of excellence what are the key things that needs to be in place yeah so building that center of excellence uh i'm sure it was not easy i wasn't there from the beginning but i can see now especially as you're scaling that quickly at the same time um one is to, to make sure you've got that vision from the beginning or just try to start thinking about that from the beginning of what it might need to look like as you're starting to scale you're as you're starting to scale you see that need that we should probably not be doing things in 20 different ways across 20 different orgs. We're actually talking to another agency that has this problem right now um, where they've got eight different orgs, eight different release processes, eight different DevOps processes, um, really no kind of common practice between the app builders or the businesses at all. Um, so it's really important to start to think about uh, things like scalability and maintainability and operations and maintenance. Um, we, uh, it's not easy in the federal space, uh, just talking specifically about this space. There's a, you have to manage all your certs. Uh, you have to put all of the security required uh, profiles, permission sets, Crud FLS, we have to do static code analysis. Um, all those things uh, require a fairly high level of knowledge of um, Salesforce and all those best practices. So having 
Also, an architect is really hard to find. So having somebody that can kind of be that voice for all of the different programs is really helpful because they can say, hey, we just did it this way here. It's going to work the same way here. It's going to work the same way there. Let's take what we learned and reuse it so we're not building everything from scratch every time. So that's the big thing is look for opportunities like that where you can reuse things. Um, think about uh, how your release management process needs to scale as you're growing and you're adding different orgs. Um, think about uh, looking at uh, commercial off the shelf solutions, uh, especially as part of a, uh, a very large multifaceted multi um, consultancy ecosystem uh, where people are in and out a lot. Uh, having a reliable off-the-shelf product or products for things like um, your release management, your DevOps, your test management, um, other security scanning tools uh, that you can use and reuse and just give somebody a week to train on and hand off as opposed to here's how we maintain all of these uh, disparate tools and uh, how we built this thing from scratch and it's going to take you six months to get up to speed on how to, how to use it. Um, so we're, we're thinking about how to add in some of those other nice to have these on top of the commercial off the shelf. So that it doesn't, doesn't feel like you're fitting yourself into a box either. Um, other good things to think about about resourcing and the partnership so mm -hmm. i'm wondering um so the the program has b3 running the center of excellence i would have thought that they should have some very key technical mm -hmm. individuals who probably should be more account accountable for strategy um, and ownership of a lot of the strategic direction roadmap, or does it all sit with B3? Yeah, so that's a, a good point. Uh, it's also important to have that separation of concerns to not have the uh, fox guard in the hen house. Um, so that's, that's kind of the role that we play as B3. We're kind of the agnostic third party to all the system integrators. And we are the, the voice of the VA IT department, essentially, to make sure that everybody's playing nice together, that the best interests of the VA and the business are taken uh, into consideration, the VA security is taken into consideration, that everybody is following those best practices. So we're the checks and balances, essentially, um, to make sure that uh, those things are happening. Um, so we, we also play the strategic thinker for um, the VA. Uh, they've got some uh, really amazing resources, but they don't have uh, certified technical architects or certified system admins or certified application architects. So they do rely on us heavily to give them that guidance. Um, and especially with the security team, they've always got constant changing requirements that they need and how to, need to know how to interpret those to Salesforce because a lot of time with federal agencies, they're written for on-prem custom build applications that were written in COBOL. <laughs> and so they have to know how in the world do we even think about translating this to a SaaS ERP system. Um, so that's where we come in. We say, all right, you have to do um, threat and vulnerability testing, uh, that's actually something that Salesforce does. So we can uh, take some of the Salesforce documentation and use that to meet that requirement. Uh, we can do static code analysis and evaluate the uh, custom built functions of Salesforce, but Salesforce actually does a lot of the things behind the scenes that uh, we wouldn't need to worry about and we would meet those requirements. So that's where we work closely with Salesforce, um, the PAs that we have to uh, be able to channel that information. We actually get to see a lot of um, things that, that are coming down the pipeline and we get to see under the hood behind shield and um, the event monitoring solutions and uh, encryption. Uh, GovCloud Plus is actually encrypted. 
uh, fully. There's no need for platform encryption anymore. So we, we get to understand all those things and help interpret those for um, the government. So if you had a large um, enterprise, maybe VA is huge, but if you had a large enterprise who are thinking about you know, going down the COE mm -hmm. um, road, would you say that it would be a good idea for them to at least have some resources internally who are certified, at least on some of the clouds? Or, you know, how, did it work well in your um, setup to have um, VA not rely so much on B3, for example, to execute their security requirements and any other functional or non-functional requirements? What would you, what would you advise, let's say, a uh, I don't know, uh, aviation company or any yeah. thing like that. What should they do? It's certainly helpful. So my first experience with a center of excellence was at uh, that first project at uh, GE um, that I worked on in Nevada. Uh, it was for GE Oil and Gas. We were um, very heavily uh, involved with the center of excellence and trying to stand up a new business unit. Um, and understanding that there is a person whose sole job is to manage the opportunity object. There's a person whose sole job is to manage the case object. And so that was really interesting to see um, that basically all decisions related to the case object have to go through this one person um, for all the you know, hundreds of applications that need to use that object. Um, so, and th those, per those people work for GE. Um, it, How did that work? Sorry, just just uh, it's blowing my mind at the moment. It's, the decisions must take a really long time, especially if you've got mm -hmm. an app that goes across different objects and does different things. Um, was there lots of red tape? How did they? Yeah, hmm. it does slow down things a bit, uh, but the decisions do get made fairly quickly once you get to that point. Uh, people are able to they've got the process down, I guess, essentially. So you, they tell you what information to share with them and then they make their decision or they might take a day to think about it and then make their decision two days later. That's kind of how we do things at uh, the VA. We have an office hours on Tuesdays. We have our uh, architecture design reviews on Thursdays. So it helps to kind of bring those things on Tuesdays that you're going to talk about on Thursdays to give people a couple of days to think about it, talk with the other architects that we have internally on, you know, what we should do, uh, what's best practice, how is that going to mesh with all the other things that we got on that object or that org. Um, but yeah, it, it does slow things down. Uh, and that's a constant battle that everybody has to fight. Uh, nobody wants things to slow down. The business is also getting judged on how quickly uh, we can get things to market. So we, as B3, we are the, the stewards of best practice, but we are also measured on how many products we deliver every year. So we're held accountable from both sides of, we can't just be a blocker. Security can't just be a blocker. They know that too. There's always that balance between having uh, enough security and not locking things down so much that people can't log in anymore. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's kind of how we, we try to help navigate everybody and, and make sure we're, we're keeping that balance. So before I interrupted you, um, you were, you were talking about um, how at GE you had people who just specialized or, or who just owned that particular object and managed that. Where do you see the happy medium uh, being in terms of, you know, having enough resources to know what they're doing in order to drive decisions that a partner can help them execute? Yeah, I mean, I know with the federal government, it's really hard because uh, I was hearing uh, some of the people that work there say it takes a year to change a job description to be able to update to, uh, you know, the certs that might be required. Um, there's also pay grades that they have to stay within um, that are all published online. So uh, there's it's, it's hard to find people with that level of talent without having to give them a general's pay grade, which is uh, crazy to think about. Um, but I, I think just having maybe a, two or three people that uh, have at least that high level 
uh, we have uh, really probably two, maybe three people at the VA that are at that level that um, have done hands-on Salesforce. They, you know, know the ins and outs of flow. They know the ins and outs of uh, config versus custom. Um, they may not be at CTA or system architect or application architect level, but they are, they tech lead. We also have a lot of citizen developers uh, that are um, VA employees that do uh, configuration apps and they help guide them as well. So they kind of play all those roles. They're stretched very thin as a result. Um, but having, having two or three is probably the minimum, mm -hmm. I guess. I'm sure larger commercial companies will have a lot more than that because um, they have different guidelines that they follow. But. Okay. So let's um, pivot back slightly to you. Earlier on in conversations, you were talking about how you're a developer at heart and that mm -hmm. you like seeing products being, you know, shaped and brought to market. Um, where do you, in your current role, where do you get your buzz from? What excites you in your current role? Um, well, I think it's more now looking at frameworks as opposed to products and how opportunities to uh, streamline the way we're doing things like uh, our domain and selector layers and um, reusable front end components. What, what opportunities are there to uh, streamline, take advantage of some tech debt? Let's uh, use platform events now that it's available. Uh, it wasn't necessarily um, in 2017 when the org was first spun up. So there's some old applications. What are what opportunities are there to take advantage of other newer sales, Salesforce technologies, functions coming out? Um, we've got integration uh, cloud with uh, MuleSoft, uh, Salesforce DevOps that's coming out. Uh, Salesforce backup and restore, what opportunities are there? And that's just the Salesforce ecosystem. You always get new fun things to play with. And that's what keeps me excited about Salesforce is uh, you do have new stuff every uh, four months that you get to take a look at and see how it might fit into your tech debt roadmap. So we also manage the tech debt um, and modules that have uh, finished development. So we can take those things and make them better, uh, take advantage of uh, newer Salesforce technologies, make them scale more scalable. Because um, oftentimes, you know, things are done as quickly as possible um, just to get them in the hands of the business uh, for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, but now we get to make them even better. And uh, that's, that's part of what excites me. And then also, you know, getting to see all these different things. We've got 200 apps. I get to see the thing that I was talking about with the Department of Defense integration for health cloud care coordination for veterans, um, just seeing the dramatic difference that will be from the on-prem homegrown thing that was built in the 80s that they were using before. Um, so just being a part of that is really cool. Gets my juices flowing. Fantastic. Next question is for me in that um, I'm, th th this is something that I'm keen to know. So. I think that it's the the tough project, those that hasn't gone as well, that actually offers the most learning. So if you can cast your mind back to the wealth of projects and experience that you've had with different clients as a consultant with PeopleSoft or Salesforce or in any, you know, in your long history, um, can you pull out a few, you know, projects that didn't go that well and what did you learn from that what, what can you share um yeah so there's a ton of examples um and i guess as part of that i also used to do a lot of uh architecture reviews of products and uh projects i guess uh and it, it's all kind of the common scene common theme between the really hard, bad projects and the reason that we had to go in and do architecture reviews because something wasn't going well for a product. Um, and yeah, so the mantra that we kind of said at Code Science when we were doing those architecture reviews was 
it's a people problem. If you don't think it's a people problem, it's a people problem. <laughs> it's not a technology problem. It's not that something wasn't built correctly. It was that the people aren't talking about what needs to be built. They aren't getting the feedback. They are working in a silo. They are not uh, being agile and shifting direction when they need to shift direction. Um, they're still doing project management the way that they were doing it 20 years ago and not adapting to newer technology that exists. They hadn't adapted to Agile. Um, and the same thing happened with the harder projects. It was really all just really nasty politics with like the merger that I talked about um, with uh, another one that happened to be uh, a company that was doing telecommercials for solar panels um, and it was just kind of a toxic environment, uh, more so than a hard project. Um, so I guess the, the learning and the thing to come out with all of that is, um, just to try to keep a level head when you're in conversations, always be open to new ideas. Um, always try to understand why people think the way that they think. Um, there's always something behind it and try to get a lot of different perspectives because the person that you're talking to, um, they might have some of these deep seated issues and be just mad that they're, the project is even happening. Whereas the five other people that are just outside the door are thrilled that you're here and they can't wait to hear what this person told you. So just to, to try and understand that it's not, it's not you, um, it's, it's not even necessarily the company. It's maybe an individual that has a reason for something. Maybe they think their job's going away. Maybe they think that uh, people are blaming them for the problems that they have when maybe that's not even true either. So it's just try to bring everybody together and say, you're kind of a playing a psychologist a bit. Here's what this person's thinking. What's your feedback on how they're thinking? Um, how can we, you know, maybe smooth this out so that we don't have these kind of problems in the future? So that's the big takeaway. If you were to look back again at, at all the decisions you've made, have you have you any regrets or anything? Or, you know, if you were to go back in 20 years mm -hmm. and speak to your younger self, is there anything you would advise yourself to do or not to do or change or be, what would you say to the younger Barton? Oh boy, that's a tough one. I kind of think I'm perfect and I did everything exactly as I wanted to, but uh, um, uh, I, I do think that getting all of that experience with a lot of different companies, being a consultant, um, really made me the person that I am today. Um, I, I don't know that I necessarily stayed at any company longer than I should have, but um, I, you know, sometimes question leaving when I did. A lot of times the reason that I left was because of a bad project, not necessarily because I was working for a bad company. Um, so, maybe take that opportunity and you know people say people leave bad managers but that's not necessarily true in consulting you leave bad projects and that's i was really grateful for some of the leaderships i had in in the past uh that would actually fire clients which was nice and that's really a company that you want to be with forever um cherish that opportunity because it doesn't happen at all companies um so i, I think maybe having that mindset a little bit earlier on of it's it's not a bad company or bad leadership it's just a bad project let me see what i can do to get off this project as opposed to let me find somewhere else to work so that's one thing um another thing is to start working on your people skills early your people management your communication your sales skills are actually super important uh even in technology uh it's getting that buy-in for your idea um, that is more important than saying, here, look at this really cool code that I wrote. It's, it's, it's uh, here's how this will impact you. Uh, here's how this is going to make your life better are things to start thinking about 
and having those really concise thoughts and being able to present those things, those ideas and those thoughts, getting your PowerPoint skills sharpened, your communication skills sharpened. Those are things that I probably wish I would have done a little bit sooner um, as opposed to just showing off the cool code that I wrote and thinking that it was perfect. That really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. It's how this code is going to impact somebody's life or somebody's business. So that's, that would be my advice is to start thinking the impact it's having earlier and how to communicate that. It's amazing. This, uh, this conversation has been so, so full of like really good wisdom and, and advice that I think I also, um, for example, the sense of excellence, there was so much in there that I think will be very useful to a lot of people listening. Mm -hmm. um, so I thank you so much for sparing me the time. I'm very mindful um, that the hours are almost up and for sharing your experience. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Barton. Absolutely, Peg. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank I haven't you. Uh, thought about a lot of these things in a long time, so it was good for me too. Oh, I'm glad. Rehashing of history. <laughs>